Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's Polsky series titled The Power of Kindness in Schools, Prisons, and Society. I'm Emily Fowler. Before we get started, I'd just like to request that you turn off any cell phones or pagers or other noisy devices that might disturb people in the audience during our program tonight. Thank you. The Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series is underwritten for the fourth year by the Norman and Elaine Polsky Family Supporting Foundation. Yes, give them a hand. And that's within the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation in partnership with Johnson County Community College. These programs are not being offered anywhere else, and they feature local professionals and individuals from our community who share their knowledge to benefit all of us. Welcome to the beautiful Polsky Theater, where most of our seminars are held. This space is used throughout the year to host a variety of programs, including our academic theater. But whatever the event, it's always wonderful when it's held in this space. So I want to take this opportunity to thank Norman and Elaine Polsky, who are in our audience tonight, for which this theater and the seminar series are named, for their generosity to the college and to other organizations throughout our community and the nation. Thank you, Norman and Elaine. A big thank you to the JCCC TV and Carlson Center production crews this evening for their work to make the stage look so beautiful. And now it's time to go through tonight's packet. So let's take a look at what's inside. This information is for you to take home and share with your family and friends and so that you remember what you learned when you were here tonight. So on the left hand side, First, in green, is Norm's My Legacy to You, an overview of five points from Jim Stower's book, Yes, You Can Achieve Financial Independence, plus 11 points that Norm feels are important when investing in mutual funds. The Stowers book is for sale at the lobby table tonight for $10. On the back of the green sheet are Norman's Ten Commandments, ways that you can be more successful in your life. Second, there are three yellow sheets stapled together, and the first page is Norman's investment article dated August 30th, 2008, and this shows Norm's recent investment results plus the current mutual funds that he holds. Attached to this is information about Midwest Trust Company and FCI Financial Counselors Incorporated. The third piece on the left-hand side in purple is a biography of Norm and Elaine Polsky, and on the back of this page is a list of the four 40-plus endowments that the Polskys currently support that help organizations all over the United States and in Israel. And lest you think I forgot, the most important thing on the left-hand side are two cards, the green survey card. We look forward to getting feedback about tonight's program, so we'd like you to give us suggestions here, how we can improve for next time, topics you'd like to see in the future, and if you're not currently on our mailing list, we'd love for you to add yourself by giving this to us tonight. We also like to send emails, so if you'd like to share your email address, we would appreciate it. Also on the left-hand side is a blue Q&A card. This is so you can ask questions of our panelists this evening. I'll be walking through the theater occasionally, and if you have one of these you've completed, either one, you can hand them to me at any time, and I'll be happy to get them to the stage for our question and answer period. Now on the right-hand side of the packet is a postcard for our next Polsky series presentation held October 1st, that's in about one month, and it's a salute to the greatest generation. So I know you'll want to come back for that. Tickets will be available tomorrow at the JCCC box office, so the number's there on the postcard. You can give us a call and make a reservation. But the most important thing on the right-hand side are materials specific to tonight's presentation, and that brings me to tonight's speakers, which are on stage this evening. For over 40 years, Sue Ellen Freed has been a speaker around the globe on the topic of child abuse and bullying. 
She and her daughter, Paula Freed, have written two books on the subject, and there is information in your packet about those two publications. They're available from Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, or Borders bookstores, so go in and ask for those. Sue Ellen conducts workshops and training to teach people how to break the pattern of bullying. She's also organized an inmate volunteer and self-help program, which is now operating in eight Kansas correctional institutions. And one of her former volunteers, Brad Jones, is on stage with us also tonight. I'm sorry to tell you that Alyssa George, Miss Kansas 2007, was unable to join us this evening. So now I would like to turn the program over to Sue Ellen Freed. So let's welcome Sue Ellen. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for coming this evening on such a rainy evening. I was hoping that you'd all be here, and you showed, and I'm so grateful. Um, Norman and Elaine Polsky have left their fingerprints on every worthy cause in this community, and they are such a blessing um, because of the things that they care so deeply about and that they support personally and, and financially. And Norman has a special passion for kindness, as all of you must know. He has been wearing a kindness button for at least 15 years that I know of. And we often accuse him of wearing them on his pajamas, but um, Elaine is the only one that knows for sure. Um, he has now created a new button for all of us. And I think it's really exciting to be talking about the power of kindness. Because all of us, I think, associate kindness with, with tenderness and gentleness and nurturing. But I think Norman really has something when he is urging us to consider the power of kindness. Norman believes that when you wear the kindness button, it changes your behavior. That is a lot of power, because changing behavior is an action that we should not take for granted. Changing behavior is very challenging. I will never forget, many years ago, um, I was working as a dance movement therapist. And I remember one morning at St. Mary's Hospital, a new uh, patient had just come into the group. And on that particular morning, we were discussing both, we were doing it verbally and non-verbally, resistance to change. And this man raised his hand and he said, I know this is my first time and I hope it's not inappropriate for me to speak up. But he said, I am just so fascinated with your topic. He said, Be whoops, um, before I came in um, to the hospital, I was an advertising executive. And um, I've learned a lot of things about how to get people to change their soap powder. And he said, one of the things we learned is that it takes 21 contacts to get you to change your soap powder. And the way they did the research was really fascinating. They um, changed um, electric switches in people's homes. So that if you came home in the dark and you were used to turning on your light switch with your right hand, they moved the switch to the left side. And they counted how many times when you walked into your dark home that your right hand automatically went up before you had reprogrammed yourself to uh, do it on the left side. And so it occurred to all of us that if it takes 21 contacts to get us to change our soap powder, Imagine how many connections and contacts we have to have in order to change patterns of behavior that have become rutted in our lives. So tonight what we're going to be talking about is dramatic changes in people's behavior. And what happened to me was a number of years ago, I remember someone said to me, do you have any idea do you have any sense of what the connection is between the fact that you've worked in psychiatric hospitals, prisons, and schools? What, what, how does that fit together? And for a moment, I kind of um, 
grappled, and, and I was kind of puzzled, and then all of a sudden it came to me. I am hooked. I am addicted to personal transformation. I have been witness to the most exciting transformations. And where else in the world would you find more profound transformations than in psychiatric hospitals, prisons, and schools? So for me, it fits perfectly. I find that being a witness to those kinds of transformative experiences is not only exciting, it is very inspiring. And I am delighted to share some of those um, transforming experiences with you this evening. I do want to share with you something about Miss Kansas. First of all, she sends her deepest apologies. When we created this program back early in the summer, Miss Kansas, Alyssa George, thought she was going to be able to be with us. I met her when she first became Miss Kansas in 2007. And as you know, any Miss Kansas, Miss Missouri, Miss anyone from any state has to have a platform. And Miss Kansas' platform was bullying. And so as soon as that was known, people made sure that the two of us got together. And we met on the turnpike um, in a restaurant. And she is so beautiful that I'll never forget, a man came over to the table, and he didn't know that she was Miss Kansas. But he said, I've been staring at you, and you are just absolutely, exquisitely beautiful. And with that, he turned and walked away. And I said, does this happen to you all the time? She said, no. She was very modest, because I'm sure it does. Well, as we talked, it turns out that Miss Kansas is, and she has given me permission to tell you the story, and the reason that she is not here tonight is that last year, because of her reign, she had to leave school. She is a student at Kansas University. She is a business major. And so she is back in school this year, and um, she has a very big test tomorrow morning. And the students get together for a study group tonight. And she called and said, please forgive me. I'm just getting back into school. And I just really need to make sure that I do this right. So, um, but she did give me permission to tell you the story of why that became her platform. Alyssa is from Minneapolis, Kansas. And I don't know, maybe somebody knows the exact population. I think it's around 3,000 people. And from the time that she started school in kindergarten, she has always been beautiful. She has always been very talented. She has always been a fantastic athlete. And she was always outstanding academically. And the combination of those four things made her an absolute outcast in her school. Because one of the things we know about bullying is that sometimes one of the reasons that kids get picked on, you know, we always think about the child that gets picked on because they're too tall or too short or too heavy or too thin, um, or they have some kind of differentness. But her differentnesses were all positive things, and the kids just couldn't handle so many talents in one person. And so she was an isolate from kindergarten through senior high school. Because in a small town like that, it's not like you can find other friends. That's all that you have. When she went to KU, she joined a sorority, and she called me. And I went to see one of her presentations that she did all over the state, talking to kids about bullying. And her sorority sisters had all flown to Las Vegas for the Miss America contest. And she said, I have never had a girlfriend before in my whole life. And now I have a sorority full of girlfriends. All those years before she ever knew the joy of friendship. So I'm sorry she's not here to tell you her story in her own compelling way. But I thought you would want to know why we had wanted to include her on the program. Um, I want to talk to you about bullying in schools. 
when I work in schools, I cry a lot. Um, and I am always so moved when children really do want to make amends. Um, they, they really appreciate the opportunity to have a chance to be seen as the kind of person they want to be instead of the person that they have been. This program was made a number of years ago. And when I was doing this program at that time, there were four kinds of bullying, physical, verbal, emotional, and sexual. Since then, what has come into our world is cyberbullying. Children are so savvy with the technology and the internet, and they have found the most devious, complex ways to cause pain for one another through text messaging, instant messaging, chat rooms, creating websites, um, stealing somebody's password and sending out a hate message. I just finished reading a book called Bully Side. This is a word that is coming into our language. It means children who have committed suicide because of bullying. And this book is the story of eight parents describing what their children went through that led to their suicides. And a number of them were because of cyberbullying. One of the stories in the book is told by a mother who I trained at a at a training institute in Florida. She is a science teacher at a school district there. So you can see why I'm so passionate uh, about this subject and why I believe in the possibility of change and healing between children. I've come up with a theory that I want to share with you. And David, if you'll put that first slide up. I believe that the dynamics of bullying is that it starts with pain. I think it'll be up in a second. Imagine a circle. And the word at the top is pain. And what I say to the children is, when, there we go, thanks. When you inflict pain on someone, pain does not disappear. It doesn't evaporate. It collects. And when enough pain collects, it turns to rage. And when enough rage collects, it turns to revenge. And then the revenge causes pain, which causes rage, which causes revenge. And the cycle repeats itself. And then I say to the kids, you know, if you look at what is going on in our world today, and all the global conflicts between countries and tribes and cultures and religions, it all started with some, some country, some, some pain. And so if we could begin to stop pain, if this generation of children could see how important it is to stop pain, I believe they could really change the world. Well, I was talking about this to a group of students in Chicago, and a young student came up to me afterwards, and he said, you need to draw another circle. He said, I have been picked on all the time. I've experienced an enormous amount of pain. But for me, it doesn't turn to anger. It turns to depression. And many times, I've thought about committing suicide. So that is the second circle. What I want to share with you is a story that I always tell the kids, because I believe that empathy is one of the most important elements of changing behavior. This is uh, in the beginning of a book by Dr. Carl Menninger called The Human Mind. And it starts out, and it talks about a group of fish that are swimming in a pond. And there is one fish that's upside down, and its tail is flapping. And all the fish that are swimming by and see this weird fish decide to swim away as fast as they can. 
And Dr. Carl Menninger went on to say that what the other fish didn't realize is that this fish had a hook in its mouth. It was doing the best thing it could considering the circumstances that it was in. And then he went on to say that in this world, during the course of your day, your week, your life, you will come in contact with many people who have a hook that is invisible to you. And what you need to appreciate is that if you could see that hook, you might understand that they are doing the best they can considering the circumstances that they're in. And children relate to this. I now want to turn to my great passion for a program that started many years ago. In 1982, when I founded uh, Stop Violence, one of the first things we did was to offer a contest to the community for the 10 most effective ways to prevent violence. And after we created the contest rules and distributed the flyers all over, we were thinking, who are we going to get to judge this contest? Who's going to be able to look at all these entries and make a very wise decision? And a number of years before that, when I was involved in child abuse prevention, the Lifers Club at Lansing had chosen to become volunteers in that effort. So I contacted one of those men that I had met and asked if he would like to gather a group of judges to judge the contest. And he said, we would love to. So a group of them began going through every one of the contest entries, and they came up with a wonderful winner. And then he said, do you have something else that we can do? It was so meaningful to us to have an assignment of how to spend our time in a helpful way. Please, please tell us what we can do. And I said, well, the thing that we need the most is money. And I am the world's worst fundraiser. And I can't expect you to raise money inside the walls. I can't raise money outside the walls. So give me some time. Let me think about what I can come up with. And they said, come back in two weeks, and we'll talk about it. Well, I came back in two weeks, and they had spent the two weeks brainstorming about the fact that they were the scraps of society trying to transform themselves into people of value. And from that conversation, they decided that they would create a line of stuffed animals made out of scraps of fabric. So we found somebody to donate a sewing machine and somebody to donate some stuffing. And the inmates, at that time it was co-correctional, and some of the women designed patterns, a frog, a teddy bear, uh, a puppy dog. And they spent their weekends creating stuffed animals. And for the first two years of Stop Violence existence, we were funded by sales of the critters. So I came back to the group and I said, you all have been so terrific for us. It's time for us to do something for you. What, what can we do for you? And they said, there are so many issues. There are so many things we would like to understand about the roots of violence in our lives. Do you think that you could find some professionals that would come and talk to us about child abuse, spouse abuse, sexual abuse, substance abuse, anger management, conflict resolution, whatever they said they wanted. I turned to the community, and I asked a professional to come and present, and no one, no one turned me down. And this inmate listened very attentively to all of these presentations, and he decided to teach a course. He has an incredible memory, and he, he absolutely memorized everything that they had said. And so he started teaching a weekly course. And another one of the people in the group had computer skills and started taking notes. And out of that came this curriculum, the blue book, called Reaching Out From Within. Three years ago, Stop Violence merged with Synergy. And um, I am no longer involved um, with Stop Violence. It belongs to Synergy. 
But the prison program has become reaching out from within. And we are just, we just had our very first board meeting last week, and we are very excited about all the things that we believe that we're going to be able to do. Well, the program spread amazingly. Someone would get transferred to another prison, and the first thing they would do is take the blue book and go to the warden and say, may I please start this program here? It's meant so much to me. And so, as Emily shared with you, it's now in, uh, we have 12 programs going in eight prisons, people who meet weekly, men and women. Well, one of the stars and one of my dearest friends and someone I love so much is my friend Brad Jones. And I thought, you, and I thought you might want to hear about this program from someone who really experienced it. Thank you. That was, uh, is it okay if I turn my chair a little bit? I feel like the, um, my back is to these people here. No one said no, so I guess it's all right. Uh, I, I haven't done this for a long time, and uh, I thought I had everything in my mind that I was going to say tonight until I watched this little clip here and, and listened to the things that Sue Ellen just said, and it brought back many, mem many memories. And, and one thing I, I would like to, uh... no, no, I'm not going to go there now. <laughs> Speak up. Yes, I will. Uh, I was, uh, just a little about bounty. I'm Brad, and I'm from Waldo. I was born and raised in Waldo. And my parents didn't raise me to be a criminal. That became my choice many years later. My parents gave me everything I needed to be a success in life as far as my morals and values. But at some point, I chose to be something different and ignore everything that they taught me. And I finally ended up in prison in Missouri. And I was a, a drug addict. I had been a drug addict. And I went into prison, and I became exactly what I was on the street, uh, except I was in prison. I was inside 49 acres, inside a wall, doing exactly what I did on the street, bullying, dra drug sales, still using drugs. And I saw no reason to change, because I didn't think I would ever get out of prison. I thought that was the end of it for me. And I... I really didn't care too much about it at the time. I, I didn't think about my future because I didn't think I had a future. And eventually, later on in, in the time, I, uh, they transferred me to a, a medium facility, penitentiary, in, up by St. Louis. And it looked like I might possibly get out someday. And I still had to come to Kansas before I could get out because I had Kansas time to do too. <coughs> So the last year I was at uh, this place called Pacific, which was a, a medium facility. And the first thing they did when they put me there, when they sent me there, there were four different houses, and they put me in the violent offender's house. And up until that time, I never thought of myself as a violent person. Obviously, I was. I was in prison for violent crimes. But suddenly, I live in a house with all the violent offenders. And I didn't like that term. I didn't like it at all. And the people that I live with really didn't seem that violent to me. This is a medium facility now. I'm not inside the walls in Jeff City. But I decided that I wanted to get out of prison, for one thing. And in order to do that, I had to change some of my behaviors that I'd been showing every, everybody involved in the prison that I was doing something differently. I was changing something. So I did. I, I started what we call in prison running a game. I, I quit running around with a lot of the people that were involved in these other activities that I shouldn't have been involved in. But it wasn't so much that I, I wanted to stop that behavior. I wanted out of prison, and I didn't want to run with these people anyway. I didn't care for them. So I started putting on this act of a nice guy. And I made parole, and not, not because of this, I'm sure. It was just because of the amount of time that I'd done. They finally decided to parole me to my Kansas time. 
but I was on a, a mission over there in my mind that I would change myself and I would keep changing it. Not because I wanted to get better for myself, but because I wanted to get out of prison someday. So I had a couple of friends of mine that, that were trying to help me in this situation. And uh, I, the first thing I started doing was reading the Bible that my grandmother had sent me. And I, I wasn't, I mean, I'd read the Bible before. I went to Sunday school when I was a kid, but I, I hadn't grasped the meaning of the Bible, the New Testament, which I was what I was reading. And I was more confused then than I was at the beginning of it. And then I had a friend of mine that started giving me uh, uh, philosophy books. And he wanted me to read Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, all these people that were so far above my head, I, I had no idea what he was talking about. I, I knew what he was talking about, but I couldn't read the text and understand, grasp what they were trying to do, what, what they were trying to make me think. But Steve would help me. And I, I started understanding a lot of it. And then one night he came to me and he said, well, because I told him I wasn't interested in, in the philosophy that much. And he came to me with uh, psychology, human behavior. And I'm laying in my room and uh, I'm reading this little book by Hugh Prather. Have you ever heard of Hugh Prather, Notes on Love and Courage? I start, and it's just paragraphs and sentences. It's, it's very easy reading. And I start reading this book and... I, this man knows what I think. And all this time, I thought I was the only one that felt this. I was the only one that thought this. I was the only one that perceived things this way. This was all mine. No one else knew this. And I'd never discussed it. And here, this guy's writing little paragraphs about me. So I realized then that changing was going to be something I had to do, that it was my behaviors that I had to change. Well, then I made parole and came to Kansas. And I was inside the walls for a couple of years. And when I got to Kansas, I regressed. I regressed back to what I was when I first got to Jeff City. And it took me uh, about two and a half, three years before I got up to where Sue Ellen, uh, well, where this, the man that started that help was Sue Ellen on the Reaching Out From Within program. He was up in what we call the minimum facility, which was a co-ed facility. And it was minimum. And I was minimum by exception because of the amount of time I'd already served. So I got up there and Greg told me about this program that they were trying to get together. He said, you ought to come down and try it. Well, I, at the time, even though I was at a minimum facility, I was still messing around. I was still doing a lot of the things that I did previously, before I went to prison, when I first went to prison. And I finally, uh, Greg asked me several times if I was interested. He said, I think you'll find it interesting, Brad. Because I, I told him the story about reading the Bible and the philosophy and, and the psychology. And he said, well, I think you'll see a lot of psychology down here. So I finally went. And I sat there in a room with probably 20 people, men and women. Men and women in the prison together. And, and this was... a way, way beyond anything I'd ever experienced before, just coming to this place. And I sat in this room, and at the time, the topic was sexual abuse, child abuse. And I sat there in the room, and it surprised me to see the people that were in there, people that I thought were uh, associates that I, that I <coughs> would gather with and talk to on the yard, people that I, I spoke to on a daily basis. And they're down here in this stop violence meeting with the women. And I didn't expect this kind of behavior from them. This didn't, they didn't seem like they had evolved past what we did on the yard, the things that we did on a normal day-to-day -day basis. But I sat there a couple of first couple of meetings, and I just listened and watched the people and observed. And then I started taking note of the uh, volunteers that were there my friend Sue Ellen, and I, I had the convict mentality by this time. I, I'd been in prison long enough to realize that there's, everybody's got a motive, or this is my thought process back then. Everybody has a motive for what they do. And I was trying to figure out Sue Ellen's motive. And she just told me tonight what it was, that you're addicted. <laughs> that's, the, that's the first time I've ever understood it. 
And there are several people out here in this audience tonight that I, uh, I didn't meet at that time, but I met later on down the, the long, and I, I understand now. I understand years later after I've got out and become a volunteer, I understand why people do it. I, I never had seen it as an addiction, but I knew it made me feel good. So it is. I mean, that's, that's what it is. But I, I started going to these meetings, and I'd sit there, and I'd see these people talking that I spoke with on the yard. And they're talking about uh, what happens to children. A lot of the things that Sue Ellen were talking about on the, on the bullying, the, the, the things that we do to children. And Greg was one of the first people that brought this to me that I can't remember when it was. Before there was a child abuse law, child abuse was under dog catcher's law. That was the only, the only thing that they used to have to convict somebody on for abusing a child was for someone accused, abusing an animal. That was before there were any laws. And he said that, and, you know, everybody was astounded. And he had, you know, he quoted the law and everything at the time. This was like, an, I can't remember what it was. But uh, we started talking, and I started listening to the guys talk, and then I hear the women talk. And they started telling stories about what had happened to them when they were children. And I thought, well, this, is only thing, this only happens to women. This only happens to girls. And then after several weeks of this class and listening to these women talk and breaking down and, you know, obviously very, very sincere about what was going on, that all of a sudden one of the guys says, yeah, that happened to me too. My older brother, my dad did that to me. And everybody was shocked. Here's this big tough guy talking about what happened to him. And I'm, I haven't said much so far in, in, in these classes. I've just been observing. And I started seeing the, the relationship between these men and women, what their motives were. At first, what I thought was, the guys are down here because the women are here. The women are here because the guys are here. But that, that and I'm sure that happened on, on a few occasions. But the whole population of our program there was there for one reason, to help each other and to help themselves. And I sat there for six years, I believe. I was, I, was, I was out of it for a while, but for six years I sat every week, sometimes twice a week in these meetings and watched people transform themselves. The tough guys that I ran with that I knew on, in the, out on the yard, when they'd see another tough guy down in there, what's, what's going on down there? And the guys, the people in the program, you didn't hear about it on the yard. They just knew that we were in the stop violence program. And they'd ask, what do you guys do? Well, we talk about, you know, psychological stuff, human behavior, what we do, why we do it. Well, what are you talking about? Well, come down and see. Well, tell me what you're talking about. Come down and see. No pressure, just, you know, if you, if you really want to know, come. And all of a sudden, some of these people that you would never expect to see there are in this class. And after a while, I, there's, I never, I mean, some of them dropped away from it, walked away, but most of them stayed. And eventually they would drop their defenses and open up. And there were a lot of tears and a lot of cracked voices. And it worked. That, that's what it took. And I, but I still wasn't completely hooked on the program at the beginning, at the very beginning, until Greg asked me to go out and talk to a group of kids. And I think it was at... Uh, one of the Shawnee Mission schools up here on uh, Johnson Drive in Metcalf. And we were talking to uh, younger, younger kids, and we were talking about child abuse, about se child sexual abuse. And after it was over with, just like tonight, there's going to be a, a question and answer thing, and we would come down off of the little stage and stand out in the audience, and people would come up and, and you know, start thanking us, and, of course, and things like that. But there's always somebody that hangs back. Always, inevitably, there's somebody that hangs back, and you can see them, and you make eye contact with them, and they'll eventually come over to you. And this little guy came up to me, and he said, that's happening to me. And I felt so good up until this moment when this little guy says, that's happening to me. And I didn't know what to say other than you need to talk to your counselor, you need to talk to your priest, your minister, you need to talk to somebody and tell them what you just told me. And the first thing I thought was, this kid's never seen me before in his life. He knows I'm a convict from Lansing State Penitentiary. 
and I've been in there for a long time, and he's going to come up and tell me that he's being sexually abused by somebody. He didn't go into it. He just said, that's happening to me, and I couldn't help him. I said, I, that's all I can tell you is to go and talk to somebody. Don't tell me. Tell somebody else. And he said, okay, I will. And he said, can I hug you? <laughs> the little guy hugged me, and I've been here ever since. I've been here with this lady, with the people involved in this program ever since. That's, that's, that's what it took was a little guy to hug me. And it worked, and it still works. It always works. And by process over the years has been, if it works for me, it can work for anybody. And it's obvious that the program does. And I, I stayed with the program, and then when we started getting out, the people that were there at the beginning and there at the end, when we started getting out and we had sponsors on the outside, we started an alumni group of people that had gotten out because it's difficult after you've been in prison for a long time. What, for one thing, you don't know, you think you know what's going on out in the world, but you don't. So you need help, and you have sponsors, and you have alumni, people that have gotten out and gone through the same thing that you've gone through. They can tell you how to apply for a credit card. Don't even try it for a year and a half because you don't have any credit. Having no credit is worse than having bad credit. And we had these meetings over at Shiny Mish. Ron Poplar used to give us his classroom at night to have these meetings. And we'd help each other. And every time someone would come out, we'd invite them down to Kansas City. Some people were coming from Topeka, from Wichita, to help each other. And it kept up. It never stopped. And then uh, three or four of us, uh, with one of our sponsors, Tana, the uh, Missouri Board of uh, Parole and Probation got in touch with, or they'd seen some kind of, I don't know how they got involved in it. I don't remember how they got involved, but they asked us to come out to uh, one of their houses and give a presentation on our program on what we do and how it works. So we had three ex-cons and, and our uh, sponsor go out to a house full of parole officers, Missouri parole officers. And we gave our presentation to them about what we had done and how we worked the blue book, how we used the blue book as discussion material, how it keeps people thinking and people motivated into thinking about other ways to do things. And they asked us to give a class for their uh, people on probation and parole. So Greg and Sam and Carl and Tana, uh, there was five of us to begin with that started going out there. And every Thursday night for six years, we went out to Independence, to the parole, parole office, and in their little office and had classes for people on parole and probation. And a lot of the, a lot of the time, uh, Carl was with me, and Carl was one of the, the guys that you would never expect to see in a stop violence program. <laughs> If you ever saw him in the prison, you would never expect this guy to belong to a, a stop violence program or something other than criminal activity. But Carl and I would pick Carl up, and Carl and I would go there every Thursday night. It's about a 25-minute drive from our house. And we'd go there, and a lot of the people that were involved in that program out there were a lot younger than us. They were kids. They were on probation. But we related to all of them, and they all related to us. And after every night when we left there, Carl and I had another meeting on the way home just with each other talking about, wow, you remember how it was for, for us when we got out or when, when we were this young and how this happened and this happened. Carl and I had two meetings a night for six years on Thursday night. And it worked. It kept us in touch and it kept us remembering how much we had evolved back to what I became. And what I said at the beginning about I was not born and raised to be a criminal, it was a little easier for me because I didn't change into something that I'd never been. I changed back to what mom and dad wanted me to be. And that's where I am today. I, I'm exactly what I, I think Alan and Mary wanted me to be. But I've met so many people in the prison that didn't have that, that don't have the environment that I had, that they don't have the, the support that I had before I went to prison or after I went to prison. But it's out there, and here you are. You're all here, and I appreciate you all being here. Thank you very much. We've got 20 minutes. Can you imagine how...
how exciting it is for us as volunteers to go to this program. Um, there are many people in this room who are volunteer sponsors. There are people in this room who are alumni of this program. Um, if any of you want to become involved, where is Susan Dixon? Susan, would you please stand up? Susan is our staff person for our newly uh, organized group. Um, at the reception afterwards, please go up to her and, and ask any of us more things about if there's ways that you can be involved with this. There are a couple of things that you really need to know. You need to know that this was done many, many years ago, and we're going to do an update. But we did a recidivism rate. A recidivism rate is the, number, the percentage of people that go back into prison after they've been released. The national recidivism rate is up in the 70 percentile. In Kansas, it's somewhere between 50 and 65 percent. The recidivism rate for this program, which is a self-help program, doesn't cost the Kansas Department of Corrections a single penny. It's all volunteer run, and it's really run by the inmates themselves. They chair the meeting. They research the uh, information. Our recidivism rate is 23 percent. And, and whenever somebody comes out and stays out, you have to realize that you're saving approximately $25,000 a year, probably maybe even closer to $30,000 a year. That's what it costs us to keep someone in. So um, I want you to know that one of the people that was very instrumental in this program that um, Brad referred to is here in the audience this evening. And I would give anything to be able to introduce him to you publicly. But even though he served his time in prison over 20 years, and he's been out over 10 years, he recently began a new job. And he's doing extremely well. But his employer does not know of his record. Because most of the people coming out cannot afford <coughs> to share that information in order to get work. I want to tell you about one of our very special alumni. Um, Chuck Thatch was in the Winfield program for 31 years in Winfield, Kansas. And when he got out three years ago, he went to Wichita, and he enrolled in Wichita State University. And last May, my husband, Harvey Fried, and I drove to Wichita and sat at his graduation, where he graduated magna cum laude, from Wichita State University with a degree in counseling. He is now working on his master's degree, and he's going to be Dr. Chuck one of these days. He, someone, he managed to get someone who gave him a house, and he has turned it into a halfway house. And he helps all the people that come out of Winfield to Wichita to make it. That's the kind of spirit, that's the kind of commitment that goes on within this reaching out from within family. I want to leave you with three assignments, and then we're going to get to the question and answer period. Because Norman is so focused on kindness, all of these three assignments have to do with kindness. The first one is, remember the, the dynamic, the pain? I'm asking you to please stop pain whenever and wherever you can. Reach out to people say the things that might heal some of the wounds. I believe that if we could get to this tipping point of taking care of each other, we really could change the world. The second thing I want you to do is to reflect on any prejudice you might have regarding people who have served time in prison. I would like you to give redemption a chance. I would like you to think about making space in our society for people who have committed a crime, who have atoned, and who are eager to earn your respect. The third thing I'd like you to do is to commit an intentional act of kindness. Um, the thing about kindness is that two people benefit. When you commit an act of kindness, the person who receives it benefits and the person who gives it benefits. So it's a twofer. It's two for one. And you all know that Norman Polsky believes that we have to make investments 
that come out with great advantages on the other end. So if you commit an act of kindness and two people benefit, that's 100% return on your investment. And I know that Norman Polsky would, would love that. So when you, when you commit an act of kindness, you, um, you help three people. You help yourself, you help the other person, and you help Norman. If anybody deserves to have somebody do good things for them, it's, it's Norman. I want to tell you a story about something that I did. I, I could tell you a million kindnesses that people have done for me and I've done for them, but this is just so recent. I just went to get my driver's license renewed. How many of you have gone through this terrible thing where you go and you have to present all this information and then half the people don't have their birth certificates, they think their driver's license is going to work, and then some people want to get it for somebody else and some people don't speak English and this woman and then you get in the line you know that goes around and I was there for an hour and a half at the end of the day and I watched this woman who handled every single one of those people that came to her with such patience such dignity and such respect and so after I had my picture taken and I got my license. Um, she was getting ready to leave. They were closing the doors. And I went up to her. And I said, I just want you to know that I have observed how you have treated everyone so patiently with such respect. I just want to thank you. And the woman burst into tears. She said, you have no idea how stressful this job is. She said, what you have just said has meant the world to me. I'm not telling you this story because I want you to be proud of me. I'm telling you this story because I want you to realize the power of kindness with our words. And we have so many opportunities every day to share those words and make a difference. So I thank you. And uh, Brad and I are looking forward to the question and answer period. Well, and I just would just like to remind you, take those blue cards and write a question down there for Brad or Sue Ellen, and we'll be able to deliver those. And Emily has a few right here. Thanks, Emily. That was wonderful, Brad and Sue Ellen. You're quite a team. Thank, thank you very thank you. much. Um, okay, uh, here's the first one. Um, Sue Ellen. Uh, you're far more beautiful than Miss Kansas. Um, it's, it's signed by Harvey. I just uh, um, Okay. Uh, the first question is, it's for both of you, why does our country have so many people in prison? Um, is it our economic or political system have anything to do with this? My opinion is drugs. I, I, I made the transition from, like so many people, I, like, I think probably 90% of the people that I knew in prison were there, not necessarily because of drugs, but it was drug related because they were trying to get drugs or they were selling drugs or they knew people that were selling drugs and they were hanging with those people because that's where the drug was and those people were doing illegal things other than selling drugs and it, it just it's like a spider web once you start once you start drinking and especially like you did, we did in high school binging drinking things like that you start acting crazy I mean everybody knows how you act when people get too much to drink they're either they either pass out or they get very loud and obnoxious and boring. Other, other drunks don't necessarily like that, so they, there's usually an altercation. You usually, in my case, I, I evolved to uh, smoking marijuana, and then that was just a, another step in the way to where I got to where I was. And once you get to know somebody, when I got to the point where I was using hard narcotics, I had to sell hard narcotics in order to maintain my habit. So people, I started knowing people that I didn't want to know, I didn't want to associate with, but I did because they had what I wanted. The same people that knew me, that knew that I could get it, they eventually know me. Now they know this person over here that I'm getting it from. And it's like a spider web. It comes out and it snares you in. And that's my theory on why most people in prison are drug addicts or have drug-related crimes. 
Brad, you mentioned violent crimes. What types of violent crimes did you did you do? Armed robbery and assault. I shot two people in, during a commission of uh, robberies. Was that the the only time that you'd done something yes. like that? Yes. Yes. When you were in prison, did you find um, that those were the types of uh, those were that type of crime was common among many of the prisoners? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I have to ask you, when you did that, you know, we all know the difference between right and wrong. Yes, sir. How do you do? What makes you do that? What makes you do the wrong thing? Uh, the easy answer is to say that my need for the drugs or my perceived drug need, I had to have the drugs. I, I, trying to explain drug addiction to people that have never done drugs is almost impossible. Uh, when I needed the drug, uh, it's like a diet. Let, let's try a diabetic. If a person is diabetic and they start going into shock, if they don't have their insulin syringe full of insulin, they're going to go into some kind of a, a seizure or and, and that's what I felt was going to happen to me. And I would, if, if long enough period of time between, I would start to go in convulsions and, and uh, involuntary movements and stuff. And it was uncomfortable. It was very painful. I didn't want to do that. And I knew how to stop it. And that's what I did. I stopped the pain. And that's what most people are doing. They're trying to stop the pain. And the pain is like the kids were talking about. It, it all, it, it's all the same thing. The pain that people feel. I was a fat kid growing up. Uh, when I was uh, 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, I weighed 287 pounds. And if someone called me fat boy, that was reason for violence. I didn't want, that hurt, that hurt me. Of course, it took me 25 years to figure out what motivated me to be as violent as I was. I didn't realize it at the time, but then I finally figured it out. This is what hurt me. I was bullied, or I was a bully, because people were hurting me. They were bullying me, and I bullied them right back. Well, I was bigger. I could take care of it. The people that bullied me didn't quite have enough. So I became exactly what she's talking about when she talks to kids. It sounded like you grew up in a pretty good household. Oh, absolutely. My father was an attorney for the state of Missouri for workman's compensation. Mom was mom. Mom took care of all of us. And uh, middle class family, very, very good. I, like I said, I had everything I needed to be a success in life. So what, how did your parents react to when you started doing these types of things? And uh, well, Dad died when I was 17, and that was, I, I didn't handle that. I didn't have the coping skills to handle that. That, uh, uh, that threw me into a poor, poor, pitiful me. Uh, I hurt this bad. I'm going to hurt other people. Mom, I devastated Mom. One of the, I, I was, when I found out I was going to do this, I, I was trying to think about all the things that, I'd, uh, that had been... Uh, points in my life that had changed my life. And one of the hardest things, hardest realities I ever had was that in 1976, my mother came to see me in Jeff City, Missouri. And Jeff City was, you know, that's, that's the big house. And I'm in here, and uh, my mom comes in, excuse me, and uh, we're talking for a while. And mom was great. I mean, my mom loved me, never gave up on me, never, ever gave up on me. Speak up, Brad. Vicki, you were supposed to tell me that. Uh, we're sitting in the visiting room, and uh, she's about ready to go, and she says, I've got to tell you something, Brad. This has been bothering me for a long time, and, and I'd spent uh, 49 months in the county jail waiting to go to trial and before I finally got to the penitentiary. So, I'm sorry, not 49 months, 14 months. And uh, when I finally got down there, and she started coming to see me, we started talking more about, you know, what had been going on in my life. And she sat there one day, right before she left, and she says, this is a terrible thing to say to your son, but I feel more secure with you in this prison than I did when you were living at home. When I hear a siren at night, I don't worry about them coming to my house to get you. If I hear someone knocking on the door late at night, it's not some drug dealer or one of your friends coming to see if you're here. You're safe in prison. That's a hell of a thing for your mom to say to you. Yes.
Okay. All right. Yes, we are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, these are some things that Norm's been passing out for years and years with his crusade to make this a kind of world. And it says, take time to listen, do a good deed, give hugs, apologize for something you've done wrong, forgive someone who has hurt you, share praise when earned, empathize, compromise, problem solve, Negotiate, don't blame. Wonderful words, Norm. And then you got some good quotes here by famous people on the back. Right. So everybody go home tonight, read all these wonderful quotes. Do you so have some more questions? One of the questions is, how could we introduce this program in the workplace? Um, how can we introduce this program? And Swillen just went over some of the key points. Um, how can you introduce that in the workplace? Because I presume bullying goes on in the workplace as well. It does. Uh, children grow up, ch children who are bullies grow up to be adults who are bullies, and um, and we all we all have to deal with it everywhere we live. You know, somebody once asked why I didn't write a book about bullying in the workplace, but I have never really worked in the workplace. I've been a volunteer all my life. And so I felt I really didn't have the expertise or the background. And a number of people have now written books on bullying in the workplace. And there is a lot of information out there on the internet. And um, so I think I advise you to go look for that. Okay. Now this is um, kind of a personal story. And um, this person writes, when I was a teenager, I was bullied by bigger boys. I told my older sister and parents my mother, was, my mother was a teacher. My question is, besides talking to those in authority, what would you tell a teenager how to prevent this abuse? Because sometimes when you talk to, author to the authority, it doesn't always help. It is true that we have to be working on this in three simultaneous ways. We have to give children skills so that we can help them. One of the things, for instance, that one of the basic things that kids need to know is that people who bully are looking for some kind of reward or satisfaction. For instance, if they can make you cry, they will come back to you over and over again because it makes them feel very powerful. <coughs> so if you can learn some of the things to do to not reward the bully, if you can learn how to handle it, some kids can handle it with humor, um, some kids can do it verbally. Some kids uh, learn how to let it roll off. Some kids really need adult intervention because they uh, have become so vulnerable. I, I just worked yesterday in a school, and I was always talking to the kids, asking them the questions, and this little girl said, you just, somebody suggested that a way to uh, avoid bullying is to just ignore it. And she said, you know, when somebody chips away at your confidence, day after day after day, you shrink and you shrink and you shrink. And you don't have the strength to ignore it. Because after a while, everything that's said hurts more and more and more. Um, I, I concentrate a lot on the witnesses, the kids who stand by and witness what's happening, and to give them the courage to become involved and connect. We need to get the, the school people. There are programs, staff training. Teachers are becoming much more sensitive, much more aware. Parents, we all have to, we all have to get involved. That's right. Brad, there's one here from a member of the audience who says, thank you for sharing your story. And I think we could all echo that. You're welcome. Um, that. And here's one that, that asks, how did you get off the drug addiction? Well, I'd like to say it was because I went to prison and there weren't any drugs, but that wasn't true. Uh, it was harder, of course, but uh, there's, a, there's a part of drug addiction that uh, the chase of the drug, the looking for the drug, knowing that this guy over in this cell house has got some drugs, how can I get over there? I'm not supposed to be in that cell house. How am I going to get over? It's all a matter of getting over 
on the people that are watching you, if you can get by. This is a big thing for people, and it's still a big thing. This will never change in, in, a, in a criminal environment. It's how to get over on somebody else. In my situation, it was the people that I felt were keeping me in prison that were responsible at this time. I thought they were responsible for me to be there. But you, you can go and get it, not exactly the drug of choice, but you have to either have money sent in from the outside. If not, then you have to be selling the drugs or some kind of hustle in the penitentiary. My hustle in the penitentiary was cutting hair. I was the only one that knew how to cut long hair, that had how to layer hair. So, and all the people in Jeff City couldn't, didn't have, they had block haircuts. I'm from, you know, you couldn't have hair past your collar or past your ears. And they had just long hair that was come down here. Well, I came in there and a friend of mine, we started layering hair and guys wanted their hair to look good for their visits and stuff. So they started coming to us and I, I had a good hustle. I had, a, you know, $3 for a haircut and a penitentiary on a pack of cigarettes was 50 cents. So I got six packs of cigarettes for a haircut. And some of the people that I cut their hair happened to be drug dealers. They were, they were selling the drugs. So I would usually get drugs from them. But it, it dissipated once I realized that I didn't enjoy the chase. I, I was not one of the chase people. I liked it better when people brought things to me. I was lazy. I was a lazy dope dope addict. <laughs> and uh, I, I eventually, it became so much trouble that I didn't want to do it. And then when I eventually got to Pacific where I told you I started making this conscious effort to appear different, uh, it was just out of the question because if I was going to be involved in drugs, I was going to be uh, around the people that were known to do drugs. And an association has killed me hurt me several times in the penitentiary. By the time, I, let me say one thing though. The first time I went out, I told you about the time when the little, the first time that I, I had the little kid come up and hug me. I got back to the institution and the first thing I did was go to this guy and I got a joint of marijuana and I went out on the porch and I smoked it. And I, I'm just, I'm so high already before I even got back there, I just thought this could only get better if I smoke a joint. And I did, and it did. I, God, this is exciting. I, I relieved every moment. That little guy touching me and, and hugging me and wanting me to help him and confiding in me. It, it all felt so good. And then I went down to Greg's, and I started telling him about it. And he looked at me and said, are you stoned? And I said, well, yeah, it's even better. He said, well, didn't you just go out to that school and tell those kids how you got to be where you are today? Started out with alcohol and drugs. Ooh, does that make me a hypocrite? Uh, that was August 29th, 1989. That was it. That was the complete it right there. And so then you've been, as yeah. I say, cold yes. turkey ever since. Yes. It's remarkable. It's a great story. Yeah, it's super. I'll still drink the beer. Uh -huh. Okay, here's another question. Can you recommend to children who to tell about sexual abuse? I was told by an, adult, by an adult that when, as a child, told others, no one helped or knew what to do. So how do you advise children who to tell when they're being sexually abused? Well, teachers are mandated reporters. Um, it is, you know, if you're a Girl Scout leader, if you're a babysitter, if you're a neighbor, if you're a relative, if you're a friend. I think the most important thing is for all of us to become people in children's lives that they can trust. And children have a kind of a sixth sense of who will really respect what they're saying. And I am so impressed with the message that we have gotten out about inappropriate touching because when I go into classrooms and I talk about sexual abuse, almost uh, sexual bullying, the first thing they'll all say is touching people in places where they're not supposed to be touched. They've heard the language. It's in every school. It's becoming more a part of the norm in our society for kids to tell about it. And that's a good thing. You know, so Ellen, you've been doing this type of thing since 1976. Do you, think, you see things getting worse or are they getting better? Uh, both. It's getting better because 
two boys shot 12 students and a teacher in a white upper middle class neighborhood. There had been lots of school shootings before Columbine and nobody cared about school shootings. But when it happened in an upper middle class white community and there were multiple deaths, society finally decided to listen. Kids had been going through agony for years and years and years and had been doing everything they could to get our attention. But it took that kind of dramatic attention to make us respond. So the good news is that the world has become aware and lots of things are happening. The bad news is, the reason that I think that it's getting worse is because the mean-spiritedness in our society is horrendous. When we were raising our children, we sat in front of the television set every week and watched Leave it to Beaver, and that was our reality show. If you were to put kids today in front of Leave it to Beaver, I mean, they would howl with laughter. Kids tell me that they run home from school at 3.30 to watch Jerry Springer. We've come a long way from Leave it to Beaver to Jerry Springer. They are a they are exposed to such sarcasm and such meanness and such hurtfulness, and it's become a part of their culture. And we have to make this tremendous culture shift, and we all have to be a part of changing the culture. That's a pretty tall order. Yes. yes. But you see, you see these personal miracles that can happen. Each one of us can be a part of it. That's true. You know, Sue Ellen and Brad, a little bit about the media, and this question kind of addresses that. Uh, it seems now when anything happens, it, it's there right, right away on, on the screen. Um, we all try to protect children from violent news reports. Is this possible? Do you find that most children know of violent acts, even in elementary school? One of the things I ache about is the loss of innocence for children. They know not only the words. I remember when I was in middle school, in high school, before I first heard those, the dirty words. I was in high school before I first heard the dirty words. Kids in elementary school not only know the dirty words, but they know what the dirty words mean. Um, I don't know. I mean, some people say the pendulum swings and we've gone so far, maybe it's going to go back the other way. I don't know. This, my wife and I were talking about this the other night. We, we sit there and watch TV, and the commercials that come on, and the video games about people blowing people's heads off, and you get so many points for blowing off an arm. How have we got to the point where that is amusement for our children? I mean, I don't have any children, but I, I can't imagine why a parent would buy that kind of a game for, a, a, I mean, I know video games are amazing. I like Pong. I really like Pong. Does anybody remember Pong? <laughs> that was a challenge for me was Pong. But now, uh, now it, it's just death and destroy. And that's, how do we get there? And how do we get back? Uh, that's, that's my question. How do we get back? Do you all, have you heard of a video game called Grand Theft Auto? Do you know that, I have not seen it myself, but what the kids tell me is that one of the things that you have to do is you have to have sex with a prostitute and you have to pay her and then you have to kill her so you get the money back and you have to kill a police officer. How do we allow people to make money off of video games that spread that kind of value system in our society? Why do we have it? Why do we put up with it? Everybody's a cyber. How do we stop it? Norman, this could be the topic for one of the next uh, seminar series that we do. Yeah. Um, Brad, a couple questions are the last ones, and they're kind of along the same line, is how do drugs get into prisons? Um, where, where do they come from in, in prisons? I mean, how does that work? Uh, there's numerous ways. Uh, the easiest way is to have a friend or family member bring them to you in a Balloon, uh, you know, depending on what the drug is, if, if you're wanting your personal drugs for your own use, you'd be a small amount in the balloon, you swallow the balloon, go back to your cell house and throw it up. Or if the more graphic way is to wait till it goes through your system. Not very pleasant, but when you're a drug addict, you really don't care. Or 
this is terrible. I, I hate saying this, but uh, you know, the a lot of the guards in the penitentiary are just right on the other edge of the guys that they're guarding. And, and this is not, uh, a, a, in my mind, a terrible thing. These guys, a lot of the people, I was the officer's barber in, in uh, Pacific, Missouri, and the colonel that ran the institution came into the barber shop at least once a week for a trim and a shave, and uh, there was a, a Route 66 went right in front of it, and right on the other side of Route 66 was train tracks. And there was a crossing there. And every day, or almost every other day, at about 1.45, a train would stop there. And, I mean, it wasn't the front of the train, but the train was blocking the, the exit there. And he was sitting there one day, I'm cutting his hair, and he says, oh, no. I said, what's wrong? He said, oh, there's another train order. We'll get a whole bunch of new recruits now, all those hobos getting off the train, crawling off the train, underneath the train, or out of the boxcars. And, and he was joking, but a lot of the people that came to be guards in a penitentiary were guys that, that had been on the farm all their life and they, the, the, the family farm had disappeared. This is, this is Colonel Fry's, and he was a very smart man. This is his theory that a lot of the people that came to work in the institutions came off of the farm, they knew nothing else, so they came and worked in a penitentiary, or they were out of the military. They had just done six, eight, 10, 20 years in the military and this, they had a pension this was a good supplement to their, their pension, so they'd come to work in the institution. The guys that are coming off the farm, they got three kids, a house, two cars, and you give them $500, a house payment back at this time in, in the 70s or 80s, a house payment to bring in a bag of marijuana, a pound of marijuana, and put it in, in a certain place. It's hard for a guy to pass that up if he's, on, if he's a borderline criminal. And there's a lot of borderline criminals out there. This will be the second to the last one. Okay. We could do this on and on. I mean, this is fascinating. Um, what can elementary schools realistically do to help stop the cycle of abuse and bullying when a parent is resistant to accept help and refuses to recognize there is a problem? Parents are a great influence on parents. It's hard to overcome that bond even when the bond is toxic. It is true. You're asking the really complicated questions that a lot of us in this field ask ourselves all the time. What I say to the teachers, because so many of the teachers get very discouraged because when they try to talk to the parents about their children's behavior, the parents are very resistant. Some of the parents are bullies, and they want their children to be tough. But what I say to the teachers is, you might be the only person in that child's life that represents integrity, that represents a different way of treating a child. And bless the teachers of this country who for so little money give so much of their heart and soul. Um, and at the same time, I have, to, um, I have to praise those parents who are advocates, who make sure that these programs get in the schools, who when they drive the carpool, um, they say, in this car, there will be no put downs. In this car, nobody will treat anybody except kindly. If you're a Girl Scout leader, if you're a coach, um, there are parents that are doing everything they can. There are teachers that are doing everything they can. Um, just keep on doing everything you can. And just cherish people like Brad Jones, who has come such a long way, and know that there are so many people in this audience this evening, in our neighborhoods, in our community, who have come a long way and deserve our support. We want to do things for people who are coming out. We want to create a library. We want to redo the Blue Book. We have so many dreams and so many plans. And I just want to thank Norman again and again for giving us the chance to present ourselves tonight. Thank you. Okay, last question. For those of us who live very busy lives and cannot volunteer, how can we help and make a difference? I'll, I'll answer this one for you. Okay. Um, you can write a check. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> you, you couldn't say that. No, I couldn't. I knew you couldn't say that. Yeah. Um, organizations like Suellen's talking about tonight only can exist through the generosity of others, and those types of results are a great return on your investment. So give that some thought this evening. Uh, Brad, thank you very much. It's absolutely a wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Suellen, thank you. Thank you. Normandy Lane, thank you. And thank you all for coming out tonight on a very oh, rainy God. evening. Before you go, um, Sue Allen mentioned that she is addicted to kindness, and I know some people that are addicted to philanthropy, and that's Norman and Elaine Polsky, and they have given me the great honor to present Sue Ellen with one of the first major contributions I think that reaching out from within has received. And if you would like to come up here, oh. I would be very honored to hand oh, this over goodness. to you. Oh, so this is a check for $10,000. Oh. <laughs> And I think Sue Ellen and Susan Dixon will be in the yes, lobby after yes. the program if you would like to speak with them or help them with what they're doing. Oh. I know they would appreciate it. Oh. So congratulations Thank on your you. new organization. Very Thank much. you. Thank you. Oh. So join us in the lobby for coffee, punch, cookies, veggies, and thank you so much for coming. We'll see you again on October the 1st.